That's fine. That's awesome. Thank you, man. What do you say? Fair dingham? Fair dinkum. Right? <laughs> what does that mean? Are we, are we recording? You're yeah, gonna... it's fine. <laughs> um, fair dinkum just means like, yeah, cool. Okay, yeah, yeah cool. Or if you say like, I don't know, it's it's really hard to kind of put it in context and to explain what fair dinkum means, but it means just like, yeah, all right, cool. No worries, right? Like, yeah, no worries. no worries. Or if you if somebody says like, um, if somebody was to say, <clears throat> if somebody was to say like, oh, it's so hard to explain actually. I don't know. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll come back to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this, this is another episode of the New Nation podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have a very fun guest on the show today. Um, also, buymeacoffee.com slash new nation. Okay, I'm making a short film soon. You guys are helping out. It's kind of um, amazing how much we've raised already. Um, it's nothing substantial or it's nothing crazy, but I'm really happy to see you guys chipping in. So go to buymeacoffee.com slash new nation. It keeps the show going somewhat uh, as this is part time, but uh, it, it just it just helps me out creatively. But we have a, a, a very, very interesting uh, guest on the show today. If you watch YouTube at all, especially in the political space, you've probably watched his videos. He has uh, very concise breakdowns of all the fun debates and all the fun speaking moments that are uh, in conservative in the conservative sphere, I'll say, or, you know, um, um, traversing across conservative media. Uh, this is Jake from Rattlesnake TV. Hey, Jake. Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. Thanks yeah. for coming over. And he's local. We're sitting right next to each other. The accent. Don't let it throw you off. He is Australian. <laughs> yes, I know. From the land down under. Yeah. Far, far away. Let's get right into it because I found your videos, I don't want to say relatively recently. I think I found you on Twitter re relatively recently. But I've watched a lot of your videos because I've seen people do what you do. They'll find some contentious moment between two people like in the right wing or someone on the right and someone on the left having a debate. And then there's a breakdown video of it. And then there is, you know, your own opinion, uh, the objective view of what happened. Not too many people do it as good as you. You're tolerable. You're palatable. Uh, you're not necessarily throwing yourself into these videos. You take a pretty partial and pretty objective point of view, which I do appreciate. I can't remember what video it was, but it was a fairly recent one where you're like, okay, I give this guy credit here. Um, I don't know if it was Destiny. Probably wasn't Destiny. Mm. Probably wasn't our favorite. Uh, I, I, black give him some, I give him some flowers sometimes. I think Destiny's okay in the sense that he'll go and debate a lot of different people on different subjects, and he's not afraid to have the conversations. My gripe with Destiny is that I'm just so totally diametrically opposed to him ideologically. Right. I don't think he's a very good example for young men. I don't think he's a very good example for anyone really, besides the fact that he's not afraid to have a conversation. But yeah, I think that honestly, Destiny's one of those guys that you can't really just try and go um toe to toe with him like verbally because he's a very talented right. like, orator but when candace owens debated him a few weeks ago <laughs> yes. she took the perfect approach she basically just took a step back and she mm -hmm. was just like hey man like there's something going on here yeah like, get off wikipedia and mm -hmm. just let's talk about the f like what's really going on here i know that you're trying to be a contrarian but right. you know like pe people are noticing things and people are waking up and and there's a consciousness happening and that was the perfect way to do it take a step back and just sort of like objectively look at what's actually mm -hmm. happening yeah the whole the whole thing with destiny not knowing how college loans work was absolutely fantastic i saw a video the other day of him talking with nick fuentes and he didn't know who francisco franco was oh right yeah, yeah I and, saw that and, and another one where he didn't know um he, he got um erdogan mixed up with assad right and, that, and that's he like didn't basic. know geographic. Yeah. He didn't know the countries where they went geographically on the map in Europe or yeah. something like and that. That that indicates to me that like he's a smart guy. He knows right. a lot of stuff, but he's very good at looking at, at a Wikipedia article yeah. and getting the very basic points and then being able to sort of obfuscate. Arguments. Right. He might have like a photographic memory type of thing. He might yeah. be able to digest information very differently and probably a lot better than maybe you or I can. But when it comes to um, being aware. Of things maybe that's probably where he gets because i mean how do you talk politics 24 7 and you don't know who francisco franco is yeah it's crazy yeah yeah it's a little weird but okay speaking of candace owens um because a lot of this has happened within the last 24 hours your thoughts on the debate between candace and ben shapiro jake from rattlesnake tv go i'm just su surprised that ben shapiro is entertaining it to be honest and i, I respect that that he's entertaining it because mm -hmm. candace owens is a formidable debater and on this topic it's very hard to dance around the fact that people use anti-semitism as a bludgeon 
And Ben Shapiro is a total liberal when it comes to this. Yes. Like, he, he constantly takes people out of context. He constantly strawmans people. He'll take little clips and do, like, what Piers Morgan does. Right. And he's like, well, you said this sentence and then misinterpret it. And mm-hmm. it's just a cowardly thing to do. So if he has somebody like Candace who can sort of, like I said, take that step back, look at it objectively, and present very concise arguments, he, he's going to struggle in that debate. So I'll... I'll I'll still be pretty surprised if it happens, but if it does, I don't see it going right. very well for him. Because as of right now, it's probably happening. I think uh, Jeremy Boring yeah. said, okay, you don't want a Daily Wire crew. We won't get a Daily Wire crew. We won't shoot at the studio. No moderator, just the two of you guys live streaming it yeah. uninterrupted. Which I think, like you said, it might be very dangerous for Ben. Because if Ben is going to try to have like an Israel-Palestine debate, that's not that it's not going to go well, only because the problems that Candace is having isn't about the logistic operations that are happening in Israel, Palestine, it's, hey, why can't I criticize exactly. Israel? Exactly. Why can't I say, hey, maybe the indiscriminate bombing of Gaza leading to the thousands of deaths of innocent isn't a good thing. Yep. And I would say the same thing about Hamas targeting innocent civilians in Israel. Yep. And like, it's a, the, the problem is that the reason why people haven't been able to say it and the w- reason why people have to dance around the issue and you know i i'm i dance around the issue on the mm-hmm. cha- my channel i'm not about to go and get myself completely demonetized and cancelled i'm still pretty young in my career in terms of this right i would love to have nick fuentes on my show tomorrow and just have a back and forth on youtube but i could get cancelled for that yes you know? yeah um and i understand and i understand the risks of it so there is a sense that we have to dance around the issue and we can't ask certain questions and that's bullshit. it really and, is and people are seeing through it now and people are sort of saying Hey, look, it doesn't mean that I'm anti- anti-Semite if I have questions about Israel's uh, policies and if mm-hmm. I have questions about the relationship between Israel and America and if I have questions about why Israel are trying to, why some extremists in Israel are trying to sacrifice five red heifers <laughs> coming right. up soon right? and why they're trying to build this third temple, which, which could send us into a biblical proportion war. Mm-hmm. Like, we, ca- we have to question that. This is like existential, like I said, biblical level World War Three events. But see, that's the thing. Ben <laughs> Shapiro will call you a conspiracy theorist. I don't know if you saw that clip where he's he's basically making fun of Tar- Tucker Carlson for, quote unquote, asking questions. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like not everything is a conspiracy theory. If I ask, if I'm talking about, um, you know, a, a certain topic, like I guess if you're talking about like Israel-Palestine, but you're just asking questions, you're skirting around either atrocities or things that you know why they're happening, but you're just asking questions. Not everything is a conspiracy theory. Mm. And it's just, it's, it's, it's whatever it's talking about literally anything else, whether it's like the moon landing is fine. You know, you can have whatever opinion you want about the moon landing, especially nine 11, something like that. But when it comes to any sort of criticism of Israel, this is what bothered me the most about the whole Candace getting fired thing. Ben Shapiro and Jeremy Boring kept on saying, we're a plat, we're, we're a publisher. We're not a platform. Okay. We're not going to pay people to publish on our platform, mm. <laughs> ideas that we don't disagree with. And my whole issue is they know what Candace was all about before they hired her. She touches upon every single subject, and she's not in line 100% with everything that the Daily Wire has to say, and they, they know this. The problem is, is that if you call yourself a publisher, the New York Times is a publisher too. The New York Times will publish right-wing articles uh, you know, in, in, op, in op-eds, in opinionated editorials, right? Yep. Like, you know... Let's just say someone like Mike Pence could write an, an op-ed for the New York Times and they would still publish it. Um, it's not to say that, you know, the New York Times agrees with everything Mike Pence says or vice versa, right? So the fact that the Daily Wire can't have someone like Candace Owens who has railed against, you know, uh, BLM, uh, transing the kids, uh, you know, um, I can say it because whatever, I don't care, but mm. vaccines, like all this kind of stuff. But it, the, the line is drawn in the sand when it comes to Israel is, to me, I think, totally hypocritical. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, we should be able to talk about all of these things. And it's just a huge red flag for me whenever I encounter somebody who doesn't want to talk about certain things who they say, oh, I'm not going to talk about this idea because if you talk about that idea, then you're X and Y. Mm-hmm. Get out of my face with that. Like, I will, I will, I want to talk to, if even, I had a communist on my show the other day, Haz Aldine, have you heard of Haz? No. Him and Jackson Hinkle are kind of like the uh, okay, market, yes, the market yes. communist guys. Right. I'm interested in what he has to say. Obviously, I don't believe that communism is the way forward, but like we had a back and forth. We had a friendly conversation. I kind of understood some of his points of view. I think that if his worldview were to ever be enacted, it would be catastrophic. Mm-hmm. But we can have that, that back and forth and people yeah. can use their critical thinking skills to analyze it. And for you to sit there and say, oh, no, we can't have this conversation because, you know, people, 
people are just stupid and they can't use their critical thinking skills and they'll just start hating. Stop it. Stop that. Are you not necessarily worried about those conversations and putting them on YouTube as far as like with the MAGA communists than you are with Nick Fuentes just because the evidence is pretty much anyone who has a conversation with Nick publicly ultimately gets co-canceled as well? He's the reaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, but the, we've the, had him on twice, yeah. and our, those videos are still up. But, but, but and they were monetized. I, 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 think. I noticed that. Yeah, and, and that actually actually was quite like encouraging to see that. But the problem is, um, like when when you get like the bigger platforms, like just pearly things, for yes. example. Yeah, yeah. That when it when it when it causes right. people to like when it causes all this controversy, like happened with just pearly things. Mm -hmm. She had to take the video down. Right. And then sooner like sooner sooner after that, she's demonetized. Fresh and fit have him on. Soon after that. Oh really? Okay, so yeah. it's it's when the it's platform a right? Okay, because yeah. as it is as it is right now, I think there's like something like twenty one thousand subs on YouTube, and it's still. I say that it's throttled. I'm feeling like they don't push our videos, so our videos nearly don't get the views that they once used to. But I feel like if we had maybe fifty thousand subs or closer to a hundred thousand, that video might have gotten demonetized or mm. you know. Sh yeah, well, I mean, Adam Sosnick down. had him on the Soscast. And that stayed up. That's still but up, right? But the thing is, that was kind of a hit piece on him. I'm not saying yeah, that, I, I'm not saying that, that Adam necessarily was framing him. I don't think Adam likes him very much. But And like, I'll give Adam the benefit of the doubt there. I won't. But but <laughs> the guys who he was with, that Nima guy, yeah, was, a, was a total, scum, awful. total scumbag. Awful. And he was going in there to get clips and to go and get like a pat on the back from all of his like... Like I don't know, like maybe hedge fund friends, or I, I don't know what it was. But Nick was but he so was, good in that debate. He was unbelievable. He was so good. I made a video about that, but I had to put it on Rumble, okay. but not YouTube, and I broke down that debate, just yeah. like ripping into that Nima guy. I think and that's that was actually how... the first time I ever really got introduced to Nick. To be oh honest. really? Yeah. I think that's how you one handles himself with with a clear troll in an in a debate yeah. in person. Uh, you know, Nick is just saying, you know, the guy's trying to defame me. I don't know what he's talking about. I thought I was here to, you know, debate and not be personally attacked. And that was it. But everyone saw that. Anyone with more than six brain cells oh, yeah. saw that. And then a lot of people got turned on to his work because of that. They were like, gosh, really? this guy's really painted as some sort of demon. Yeah. And, you know, Nick, I would say the, my, my biggest gripe with Nick would be that he's a bit of a liability. He's a bit of a loose cannon in the sense that he'll just, he's unfiltered with right. the things that he says. And if I were to have that, like, one-on-one -on -one conversation, which we will do eventually... I'd probably try and like ha have that talk with him and be like, like, do you understand why people think that you're such a liability? Why they wouldn't yeah. want to necessarily be associated with you because you could say these things. Sure. But I mean, that is just the environment that we exist in, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think within the next five years he's going to be, and you know, he may not like it if he if he hears this, but he's going to be a mainstream voice. Yeah. I think in the way that he is maybe more palatable to. To, to the to a mainstream audience rather than like kind of where he is right now mm. but I think I think it's only gonna shift as time goes on I think you know where where we are right now a lot of people see Nick as like super far right mm. a lot of people see me as like super far right but I think I hate using like Overton window or like the pendulum swing in this way I just think that um, you know it's going to start to be more mainstream our positions. Um, within the next five years, especially with like the Zoomers getting a little bit older, and you know, if they start having kids and stuff like that, mm. I think what I found with with him was that like, first of all, um, when, when when you as a like a someone who does political and cultural commentary myself and occasionally does live streams, when you look at a guy like Nick, easily the most talented political commentator of our generation, most entertaining, there's, yeah. There's no there's no close second, mm -hmm. and that's just my personal opinion. When you look at him, is like I feel like a like a like a rookie sort of basketball player who's looking at like Michael Jordan just like why do I even bother <laughs> but like he's so talented in that regard but also when he um when he did the Israel Palestine coverage over the last few months yeah most nuanced oh yeah most nuanced commentary I've seen most informative commentary I've seen like out of out of anyone and I was and I I've actually taken a lot of his points from his show and talking points and yeah. sort of regurgitated them on my show we had him on the first time we had him on. He gave this maybe ten minute, but seemed like an hour long dissertation on kind of like the history of the Russia Ukraine hmm. uh, conflict. So much so that when Destiny was going to debate him on it, Destiny was watching our video of, of his appearance on there, and that's that's what I appreciate him for. I mean, kid talks about anything. He's super smart, super eloquent, so Funny very. As well. Yeah, but that's the thing, funny. Like, mm. the kid is just so funny, and uh, I think he's going to start winning over a lot of people. Here's a topic I wanted to talk to you about, because I think I saw you tweet about it yesterday, and it's it's regarding the fresh and fit guys, but overall, the red pill. Mm. Do you see the red pill movement as a, as a net negative, net positive, or kind of uh, in the middle somewhere? 
No, I see it as a positive. Okay. Yeah, I definitely see it as a positive. I mean, I think when you look, so, so just from, for me, for example, it's been an, a positive on my life mm -hmm. because I watched a lot of Fresh and Fit. And like I said before, I think that people can use their critical thinking skills and they can watch this content and sort of, sort of discern what is useful and what's not. Right. So for example, these Fresh and Fit, they do a lot of shows about how to get your money right, how to be financially responsible, mm -hmm. how to act with the women in the modern world, which is important. I don't agree with all of their points right. about, you know, being like a player and mm -hmm. sure. and, and what, what and necessarily all of the things that women are necessarily looking for. I think they miss the mark with a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. And if I ever go on there, I'll be happy to debate them about it. Right. But I think that, that what's happening with the red pill movement is that it's the direct and antithetical response to feminism. Right. We live in a very feminist culture. So now there are a bunch of guys who are getting together and being like, hey, I'm, I'm feeling disenfranchised with this culture that we live in. I don't really know what to do. I feel pretty invisible. Let's get together and let's just start talking about the remedy for this. Mm -hmm. Red pill guys are coming up with their solutions and it's very much an atheist, modern world type view. And then you've got the trad cons right. who are more just like get married and shut up sort of right. thing. And then I probably fall somewhere in the middle of that okay. where I think that we we live in the modern world. We have to contend with the modern world. We're not going to be perfect. We're sinners. We live in a fallen world. Yeah. We have to be able to exist in this world and try and stave off all of the temptations, try and stave off all of the he hedonism, whilst at the same time trying to aim towards virtue. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah that should be the... There has to be a North Star, but we have to contend with the modern world as well. How old are you? 28. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Pre-30. You're single, I assume? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, taking all of that into consideration, so you, you say that you fall a little bit kind of in the middle between the trad cons and the red pill, because there, there are some points that I would agree with the red pill movement on, and I think I did earlier on. It was when Pearl entered mm -hmm. the movement and when people like Rolo Tomasi started to getting a little bit louder, where I was just like, I don't, I, the, the whole... The whole kind of, you know, guys should be able to spread their seed with as many women as possible and get as many bodies, but we don't want the women with the high body counts. But with us, it's okay. I saw that as a little bit of uh, as yeah. a hypocritical position, though people are just saying, oh, come on. Like, you know, w it, there's, there are differences between men and women. Men and women are different. And so this is why it's okay for men to do this, but women can't do this. It's not uh, virtuous or it's mm. not appealing to guys. And that goes to, I think the trad cons and the red pill might be having a little bit of a crossover moment because Charlie Kirk said something <laughs> pretty benign the other day and women went absolutely nuts and the white knights went absolutely nuts when he said yeah uh you know women in their 30s they're not in their prime anymore and people lost their marbles mm -hmm. and my wife's she's gonna be 35 this year we have two kids and i said hey wouldn't it wouldn't it just be objectively true to say women who are in their lower to mid 20s are just more physically capable of rearing and bearing children right mm -hmm. and she's like yeah oh totally that's why you know a lot of problems in pregnancies happen with women who are older a lot more miscarriages a lot more um uh, you know just just physical uh negatives to being older and being pregnant and obviously their looks mm. now a lot of women say well i'm 35 and i feel like my in my prime and at my most beautiful sure that's subjective but mm -hmm. overall if you poll 100 men 100 men out of 100 men would probably say yeah, women who are 25 are in their prime physically versus women who are 35. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just a fact. And uh, like, like a lot of women, when they hear that, like you should be able to age gracefully. Mm -hmm. And I, I see a lot of guys who don't age gracefully just as I see a lot of women who don't age gracefully. And when you're a 35-year-old woman, you should not be single and running around and trying to be hot and sexy. This is when sacrifice comes into it. Mm -hmm. And you should be at a stage in your life where you're, you're like leaning into your feminine maternal nature at that stage. Right. If you're still 35 on Twitter saying, is calling yourself a feminist and saying women are just as beautiful when it, it's like, there's, it's over. there's, there's something wrong there. I can't yeah. really get through to you. Like I had one trying to go at me the other day on, on Twitter and I looked at her bio and she's like an older sort of lady and feminist sort of, you know, pride. And I thought it's done for you. You've it's been over. corrupted. Yeah. And this is just the, the cold, hard reality of it. And it's kind of similar to guys who are in their sort of late thirties, early forties, and still living that hedonistic lifestyle. It's like man cannot live on bread alone, you know. Right. And what, if you don't embrace and lean into sacrifice, and if you don't embrace and lean into what's truly meaningful, and and I, I think that like there's a character arc that has to happen with everybody. I think mm -hmm. the hero's journey is a real thing. 
like when we go in, out in our sort of 20s, we can be a bit more reckless and yeah. zealous and, yeah. and learn life's lessons. But then eventually you come back home and you teach the lessons that you've learned from your journey and from your adventures to other people and you pass on your Absolutely. wisdom. That is the hero's journey. And, that, and everybody has to embrace that arc, that personality arc, that life arc. Men have to do it just as, as much oh, as yeah. women have to do it. And if you're still in your late 30s, early 40s, claiming to be a man who's just like, you know, such a player, running around having sex with all these women, you're a loser. And if you're still a woman saying, oh, I'm a feminist, you know, don't need no, you're a loser. Yeah. No, I agree. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, you know, an actual representation of that. You know, I, I, I've said the story a bunch of times, but in my mid to late 20s, touring and working with the people that I worked with, traveled around the world. Aust in Australia, I was a hedonist. If I told you the things that I did in Australia while on tour, just because I don't know if you are Australian women, just it doesn't matter where you're from. If I say, hey, I'm from New York, two, three girls just willing to do like whatever. Same as Australians in America. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, so I like I like the Australian accent on girls. <laughs> A lot of guys don't. I don't. I, do. I can't stand it. <laughs> I do. I, I love it. But um, but yeah, that that was that character arc for me where it wasn't until I think I met my wife and I realized like, OK, this is this is someone who I want to spend my life with. And we both came back to the church kind of like around the same time after we were married. Looking back on that part of my life, I get. I get chills in a bad way. Like, oh, I can't believe I live that way. Mm. It's, 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 yeah, I'm, it's I'm the same, dude. I'm the exact same. Like my, I didn't sort of start to lean into faith until I was about 25. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't start to openly say it for the last, like until about the last six months, a year. Yeah. Sort of thing. I was kind of hiding it, ashamed of it and afraid to say it because I knew how much of a hedonist I'd been in my life. Right. And I knew I've done all of the sex, drugs and rock and roll. Right. You name it. Mm -hmm. I've done it. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I've, I've, I lived in like Hackney in London for three years and I used to party all the time and then lived in Melbourne and was like trying to surround myself with all the cool kids and yeah. always in the sections at the clubs and just, you know, doing stupid, dumb stuff that a young man does. But I think I'm at the stage now where I can kind of look back at that and be like, definitely wouldn't emulate it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like the path that I've taken, I'm not necessarily so devastated about it because I can, I think that I've got like wisdom to be able to speak to young men in a way where I've done all of that bad stuff. Yeah. And I've also started to lean more towards a righteous path, albeit very flawed. Yeah. And I can speak, speak to that in a way where I can go to people's level. Right. Now, are you, are you, are you Christian in a, a sort of non-denominational sense? Are you, are you, I'm, I'm still learning a lot about the faith. So I haven't, for example, read all of the catechisms. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily denominational. I would say I'm leaning more towards Orthodox Christianity. Okay. But I need to learn more about Catholicism. Sure. sure. So, I mean, I'm, I'm always open to reading materials. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Come to church with us one day. I'd love um, to. Um, yeah, well, I was just going to say, I was listening to um, a podcast about St. Ignatius of Loyola. This is the guy who started the Jesuit order. He was a womanizing soldier in mm. Spain. And these guys, when you listen to some of these stories about the saints, like St. Saint Moses the Black, like these people who were thieves, St. Paul, was a murderer of, he was a murderer of Christians. Mm. Uh, all of these people who've had these um, lives of hedonism, of death, of theft, when they come to Christ, the story is absolutely amazing. And that, the, the fact that saints were human, they were just like us. So if anything, that gives me hope. But what I also want to talk to you about, I have a lot of friends from my past professional life, people that I still talk to, who are my age, if not a little bit older, who are still single. And I never want to reach out to them because it's none of my business to be like, hey, why are you still single? Why are you still going out? You know, have you thought about having a family? I assume maybe not because you've been dating this girl for 10 years and you haven't gotten married yeah, well, yet. You haven't yeah. gotten kids. Like, have you ever thought about reaching out to friends like that? Or have you, I mean, you're still a little bit younger, but is it right for me to do that? Or is it just kind of like, hey, Mike, you know, they're living their lives. We know that you want to have the best intentions by, you know, encouraging them mm. to, you know, start a family. But I understand it's not for everyone, but... At the same time, I think if one's not going to start a family, one should be celibate. One should be a little bit more reserved and not necessarily, you know, you know, going out and partying all the time. Like, I get that. It's fun. You're living in New York City or L.A. or whatever it is. But I kind of want the best for you. Mm. And I might, I might not be making as much money now. I might have to, you know, break my back and provide for my kids. But I'm so much happier. And I'm not comparing my happiness to them. I'm comparing my happiness to where I was before. So, I don't know, would you reach out to friends and be like, 
Well, I, I mean, I'd first probably start by reaching out to myself because yeah. I'm, I'm at a stage now where I'm pretty new to this game, man. Like I've had my channel for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Before then, I was pretty much chopping and changing careers every sort of year and a half sort of thing. I did recruitment for a little while and okay. personal training. And this is when I was still living in Australia and kind of living the high life. And I've only started to come into that sort of desire to have a family and like really can't wait now. It's like, it's my North star at the moment is to be able to establish myself over the next like six months to a year or so mm -hmm. and then meet a good, you know, Christian girl who I can have a family with and have kids with. That, that is my absolute North star. So that's, that's my ambition at the moment. And I kind of reach out on a local level. Like for example, one of the big reasons why I've leaned into faith so much is because I started praying properly last year. Mm. I started trying to develop a relationship with God. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, um, a case for Christ. There's a uh, book that is that is Lee that the Strobel? guy who is he a is he a journalist and I think his one of his kids is starting to choke at a restaurant yeah, and yeah, someone yeah. saves yep. him in, and the, the wife is yeah. like it's happened for a reason mm -hmm. and he's like ah God's not really a... exactly okay yeah so Lee Strobel and he wrote a book called A Case for Christ mm -hmm. and he was a he was a militant atheist right right and it was similar to me I used to work at the Salvation Army for a few years right okay and they were like Bible thumpers. Mm. And they used to try and evangelize all the homeless people. And I always used to debate them. And I'd say, you guys are stupid. You believe in like some sky daddy. You have no evidence for it. And you're here trying to evangelize these basically lost homeless people. Mm -hmm. like, you, like you're wasting your time. I was that guy okay. for, for, for quite a while. And in, when in my early 20s. And so, but I, I watched that movie recently and it really, it really resonated with me because like the way in which he came about was just through like finding the evidence. And I'm a pretty evidence-based person, right? Yeah. And then he looked into the evidence for Christ. And there's a moment in the movie where he sits back after all of the evidence is done. He's weighed down by it. And he sits back and he goes, okay, God, you win. That was the exact <laughs> moment I had. Really? And I was like, all right, listen, if you're up there, I'm going to start trying to talk to you a little bit. Okay. I, I give up. I yield. The evidence is too strong. And I started to pray. And then I like miraculous things started to happen. Really? Yeah. So I, I don't really know if it's necessarily like a good thing to... To, to share this in the public, but I think maybe, maybe it might be worth it. So I was praying for my older brother and I started saying, God, I, I want you to show yourself to my brother because I think that he could really use you. He's such a competent, established, like reliable guy. He's got all of these things, but he could just use that attachment to the eternal. He could use, he could use that, that thing, you know, what the, a selfless that, prayer, by that the way. Intangible. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And so I started to pray for him. We never talk about God. Mm -hmm. The next day I get a phone call and he says, and we're just, we're just chatting and he goes to me, oh man, I was talking to, to our friend Indria, another friend of ours. He goes, and we just started talking about God all of a sudden. And I was like, I was blew my hair back and I was like, okay, that's weird. I didn't say anything. Right. And I was like, oh yeah, like, would you talk about this, that? Anyways, the conversation moved on. A few days later, he calls me back again and he goes to me, dude, like, I just can't stop watching sermons on YouTube. And I was like, wow. And he's yeah. like, I keep watching these sermons from this church down the road. I'm thinking about going, but I'm like really nervous to go. And I was, I was just like really taken aback by it because I was like, I was like, that, that can't be a coincidence. And like right when I asked for it. So that's, that's what really kicked me in the ass. And like a lot of, it's, I don't, I don't know how to explain it. And I mean, that's why I kind of like love Christian mysticism in a way, because it feels so supernatural when you step back from it and you're saying, you're saying, okay, first of all, this evidence is so substantial. I, th I can't think any other way. Fine. You got me there. Let me go even further. Let mm. me pray for my brother. I've never prayed for him before. Something, you know, something along those lines. And the next day your brother calls like that. It shouldn't make any sense. Right. Mm. But it's all tied in together. And it's absolutely, I, I, I mean, the, the way I came back in was doing the show, a lot of people were saying that, you're, Mike, you're blaspheming a lot. And I said, okay, I'm not, you know, I'm an agnostic. I'm not, what, is it, what does it matter, you know? And the more I started hearing that from people, I started getting a little bit of, of a conviction because I had this life, I'd grown and raised Catholic. Um, and it's, it's something that a lot of, you know, a lot of Catholics have the same stories. They grow apart from the faith. And for whatever reason, it was through, people have heard this story, it was through Shia LaBeouf talking to Bishop Barron. It was yes, Cliff, great interview. Cliff, great interview. Cliff Connectly and his son Stuart. I read Stuart. the uh, Seven Story Mountain after hearing that interview. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah, because they talked about that quite a bit. And it was, it was, I don't know what it was, but it was, it was almost as if God was trying to tell me, come back. Mm. Like, we want you back. 
come back. And so I remember, I don't know how far away it was from either watching a couple of those episodes or hearing Cliff evangelize on college campuses or anything like that. But remember I said, okay, let me start praying a rosary. And I started to pray this rosary and I felt Mary just kind of like giving me a hug, like from behind, just giving me this hug. And it just felt warm. It just felt like, okay, that's, that's, that's our mother welcoming back her son. And I can't, I can't deny that at all. So I started to dig in really deep and people were like, Mike, you're digging in really deep. And a lot of people would say, oh, Mike, you've been a Catholic for a year, uh, you know, kind of calm, calm down a little mm. bit. I said, no, 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 no. I think I've been a Catholic all my life. I've just been away for a little bit. And I got very zealous and I still am very zealous. And a lot of people were like, a lot of people say this to me on Twitter. A lot of people say this to me on Instagram. It's like, you have to be careful how you speak to people. You're going to turn a lot of people off. Yep. This isn't very Christian. I get this all the time. Yep. And what I've said to these people is I said, I think, I think, I don't want to, because there are a lot of people who will speak for God. And there are a lot of people who say, God speaks to me in a certain way. I don't necessarily say that. I, th I said, what I said was, I, I said, I think God wants me to not evangelize necessarily, but I think he wants, I think he's pleased with my level of zealousness. Mm. I don't think he's displeased by that because since I've started really digging my heels in and talking to people about it and then changing the format of like the Instagram from a podcast about culture to strict, you know, Catholic fascism, <laughs> I've, br I've, brought, I've brought people to the church. You know, I, I, I photographed a wedding of two people who, in part, they said to me, you're one of the reasons why we are entering the church, this, you know, and, and we have Protestant parents and it's going to kill them. But, uh, you know, listening to you, listening to other people, like we feel this way. I've had other people going like, Mike, I'm about to enter RCIA. Thank you so much. And I'm just saying, I understand that sometimes I might be a little bit, um, a little bit harsh, a little bit, maybe too straightforward, um, and a little bit, uh, hyperbolic. But for the people who don't want to listen to it and who don't get it, that's fine. I understand it. But there are people who the message is going to hit mm. the way that I'm delivering it. And if it resonates with them, that's fine. I love that. So I, I, th I think it's very interesting, you know, two guys like us who, who come either to the faith or come back to the faith a little bit later in life. I think it's, yeah. you know, it's a story as old as time. Yeah. I mean, I love talking about it now as well. And I get a lot of that because... If you, if, if you looked at the progression of my channel, it started off with me talking a lot about like body language and mm -hmm. debates and I would, I would never invoke any sort of religion or faith because I was like, oh, I don't want to sort of throw that upon anybody. But then as I started to like lean into faith more in my personal life, there probably isn't a video that goes by now where I don't say something or at the, at the at, at least at the end of the video, I'll, I'll say something to plant the seed in somebody's mind right. about the faith and I'll play a clip or I'll make a point that if somebody is not quite there yet, mm -hmm. they'll just get those points of contact where they're constantly hearing those points. And, you know, I'm working on a script at the moment for about why all these atheists are now coming to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make some, make some more solid arguments and like really sort of project that. But I get, you know, so my audience is basically like, you might think of my audience as kind of like a Constantine Kisson, Chris yeah. Williamson, yeah. Jordan Peterson, those sort of, more classic liberals and I, I talked to Dave Rubin on my podcast I've okay. talked to a lot of these guys and p people wouldn't necessarily view me as that like really Christian creator but now I'm going more hard with it because I realize that it's the thing that our society is lacking and if, if, if I've got a north star and if my north star is to know God and make him known then I have to be more zealous about it yeah and it, it, I can't just put little bits and bobs in anymore I, I have to be more staunch about it and it is difficult because I get a lot of people saying, oh, I used to I used to like your content, but now you're on all this God stuff. You're a grifter. Now yeah, you're grifting. Exactly right. And it's like, it's the opposite of a grift. If I wanted to grift, I would do the opposite right, of that. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's not a grift. And like, um, yeah, so I get a lot of that. But for me, I look at it as just cutting dead weight. Because mm -hmm. if people don't want to interact with that, then you're not necessarily the people that I want that I want to talk to. Hopefully you'll come around and want to talk to it. But I really want to talk to the people who are interested in ideas and interested mm -hmm. in conservatism, but not sold on God. Right, right. Oh yeah, and that that market is that market is quote unquote you know so untapped. Like, yeah. there's there's someone who does what you do, 
and he'll do a lot of like Frank Turek videos. Uh, not Modern, a reason. Daily dose of wisdom. Yes. Yeah, he's yes. a good friend of mine, Brandon. Oh, is he really? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. I figured when I was when I was like, okay, maybe I'd talk to him about daily dose of wisdom because you you guys are kind of like on opposite ends of doing the same thing, but where you're headed now, it's like kind of. You know, it's funny. He's a, he's he was the second guest on my podcast. Really? Yeah, and a lot of the a lot of the questions that I was asking him were very much like not quite there yet questions as in like i asked him i was like do you ever feel like you're crazy you know you're, you're <laughs> praying and yeah does, does that ever does that thought ever cross your mind that maybe i'm just crazy and i was talking to him about some of the evangelizing work that he's done in africa and the spiritual experiences that he's had where he's seen the devil like at, like acting through people oh, really? in africa he's a really interesting dude okay. he's done some great things and i was kind of questioning him at, from from the perspective of like you know not like skeptical very right. skeptical yeah but he actually that conversation was very significant for me because he helped me to sort of along in my journey and since then we've kept in contact and we've talked and we've emailed and he's been really happy for me that he's I've, american right yeah okay he's in, he lives in florida and he's been really happy for me that i've sort of come more into faith and Actually, last year I got invited to Mar-a-Lago for Dinesh D'Souza's film. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And I, he was my partner. I, I, I had a plus one, and instead of having a beautiful lady, I bought Brandon. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fun. Here's a question. Do you have any questions about Catholicism? Who, you, you know, Have you ever had the opportunity to ask a Catholic a question? I know you said you were kind of like not necessarily leaning, but interested in orthodoxy, and mm. we're kind of like on the other side of that. Well, the, so the Catholics believe that the Orthodox are correct in their doctrine, right? Well, I think the Orthodox believe that they're correct in their doctrine, yeah. and I, I guess the, the Catholics would say they think they are. Sure. Right. Yeah. So Catholics pray to saints. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Why do you pray to saints, and why is that appropriate? Okay. So the whole intercession of, of asking uh, for the intercession of saints is, uh, I'll give you a couple of things. It's based on Mary's actions at the wedding of Cana in Luke, if you go read Luke. So you know the story of the of the wedding feast that uh, Jesus and Mary and some of the apostles and disciples are invited to. They run out of wine. And I guess at the time, running out of wine is not a good sign. Mm -hmm. It looks bad on the family. So Mary sees this. And I think, you know, the servants at the wedding, they're not going to go directly up to Jesus knowing that he's performed miracles. And it's like, hey, can you do something here? Mm. So what Mary does is he goes to Christ and or she goes to Christ and she says, can you, can you do something? You know, in layman's terms, I don't know the exact quotes, but can you help this family out, please? She goes to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. So that's kind of something that we can point to for Mary interceding on someone's behalf to God. Because the common, the, the, the common um, uh, rebuttal to that is, listen, there's one mediator. That's God. You can pray directly to God. We mm -hmm. understand that. And we understand that as Catholics. Obviously, we can pray to God. We can go directly to him if we want. But the great thing about the saints is, is that they are alive in Christ, in heaven, in direct communion with God. And all pray means is to ask, hmm. right? So like you would, you know, if your friend was going through something, you would certainly say, can I offer a prayer for you? Right? You would be interceding on your friend's behalf. Not to talk down about Jake or anything like that, but, you know, if someone's not feeling too good and he's about to go into the hospital, I'm going to... Pray for him as well, but I'm also going to ask St. Luke, the patron saint of doctors, mm. to, you know, intercede on our behalf and, you know, bring our prayers to God as well as going directly to God. But it's like, oh, we have a great messenger here as well. So it's not that we're like obfuscating God. It's not that we're pushing God to the side. We're, we're, we are using the saints in the way that they want to be used. They want to be praying for us. The saints in heaven are are glorifying our actions there. I, I believe that they're looking down on us and they're so proud of us when we ask for their intercession hmm. because that's what they're there for. And I hope one day when I'm in heaven, uh, you know, someone will pray and ask me, Mike, can you really pray for me, please? I'm really having a lot of trouble. And it's like, oh yes, the patron state of podcasting or something like that. You know <laughs> what I mean? I think that'd be great. Um, so I think it's just, you know, it's an extra magazine in the holster. Hmm. You know what I mean? If that makes any sort of sense. Makes sense. Another question that I'd have would be, I'm really trying to find my voice in this whole whole thing, and I tend to be very open to conversation, like mm -hmm. we were talking about before. I'll, I'll I'll literally speak to anybody who I find has an interesting worldview, even if I totally disagree with yeah. them. I don't necessarily push back. Maybe I'm a bit too agreeable. I don't necessarily push back that much, and also I'm not as well versed in scripture and in defending the faith and in apologetics. I don't know. I don't know as, anything about scripture. I call, I would call myself an ignorant yeah. apologist. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. But I'm not as well versed in in like apologetics, for example, as I should be. What what to what extent do you think that 
a Catholic or a Christian for that matter, has to push back and has to defend the faith because sometimes I find myself maybe not pushing back. When I had the Dave Rubin on the podcast, I only had 20, 20 or 30 minutes with him. Right. And I wanted to like sort of make that introduction. But looking back on it, I, I probably should have brought up things like, for example, that he um, is a, a father with another man to a child and they, that child doesn't have their mother. Right. H- how much is it the responsibility of of us to push back and to... Well, I think it's I think I think it depends upon the context, right? Like if you want to I mean you'd be you'd be or he'd at least be viewing that as kind of like an attack, right? You're you're attacking me and who I am and my family and sort of thing. So that's why it would depend on the context. If you guys are going to have a discussion on, you know, IVF or adoption or something like that, then the context is is perfect for that sort of thing. But if you guys are having a, you know, a perfectly sort of uh, normal conversation about culture and politics, then you know, bringing it up would be on you. Mm. And if he pushes back on any sort of issue, then you have every right to defend yourself and defend the faith, obviously. I think what the Christian, what the Catholic needs to be is well catechized. You can't have someone who claims to either be a Christian or who claims to be a conservative directly um, sort of not, what's, not, not disagree with the position, but just totally obliterate the position you know what i mean mm. if, if someone were to say well you know well i'm gay god created me this way and you know my relationships with men is perfectly suitable in the eyes of god and as a christian or a catholic if you were to say oh yeah you know okay okay if you believe it that's that's totally unsuitable that's mm. just it's not right because you are sinning in a way if i see you sinning and if i don't say anything that's a sin you know, like that it's just as bad. So I feel like if you see someone who is living a life of sin, who's totally contradicting the faith in order to appease his own narcissism, I think it's actually good and it is duty bound for you to call that out. Mm. Um, and it's hard too. It's hard, especially if you know the person, if you're friends with the person, it's really hard to call that out. And if you're new to the faith, they might, they, they you know, they might come back with like, you know, you're new to this. What do you know? Like, who are you to judge me? The, the big, one of the biggest Christian copes is that I find with a lot of Protestantism is, hey, you know, we're called not to judge. And it's like, no, we're called absolutely to judge. Yeah, we so have- this, is, this is my thing. Like, when I view Jesus, I view Jesus as the ultimate symbol of masculinity. Mm-hmm. I, I, I kind of see Jesus as a, like a badass sort of figure. You know, he yeah. was like a rebel at, for his time. And I don't, I, I don't really identify very much with the people who, like you just said, say, oh, you know, we're called to not judge and turning the other cheek. Well, turning the other cheek didn't necessarily mean to just ignore everything. Turning the other cheek means, well, slap me on the other side of my face. Right, you know? right, right. So uh, that, that's the way I see it. But I guess that's the difficult part for me is finding that sort of like real resoluteness where you can call out and challenge those things, still be respectful, still maintain relationships, you could, but, but yeah, be, if be sturdy if it's in with, If it's with love, yeah. you know, there, there's, there's nothing more incorrect about someone saying that a man who is, um, I don't want to say meek, but a man who's coming or, or, or not judging or criticizing, but if you were to give me some position that is totally, you know, antithetical to the, you know, to any Christian position, I would come at you with love but I would do it in such a way where my intention isn't to hurt you. And mm. a lot of people would say that's, that, that's maybe like a f- some sort of feminist, ca- not feminist, but feminine characteristic. Mm. But I think, if, I think it's men's duty to, you know, we're called to love one another. And if, 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 if I see you sinning, if I don't do anything about it, if I don't talk to you about that, then I don't love you. And then I'm not acting, in, you know, as a good Christian. So, yeah, I, I, there, there are a lot of problems with masculinity today. And... Christ is the most masculine figure. His church is his bride, right? Christ is masculinity. And in all of, you know, Christ, I always say this a lot. I say Christ wasn't nice. He yeah. was kind. Yeah. And there's a very big difference. Huge but when, difference. But yeah. when Christ needed to flip some tables and lay down the line and tell people, hey, if you mess with kids, you know, it's better that you be dead. Mm. But at the same time, he's like anyone, you know, that 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 um, hurts the littlest of, of of me or of them is you know I'm, I'm it's not going to be fun for them mm. um so that's that's what i think about that yeah those i'd say those would be the questions that the main questions that i've got on my mind at the moment yeah the saints one is a good one there's a lot of confusion around there i mean if you go to an orthodox uh church or if you go to a you know catholic church uh at the end of our mass in particular i and i go to a church not i don't go to the the lat the latin mass that's around the corner from here i go to a different latin mass but at the end of the the end of the mass, we all say the Saint Michael the Archangel prayer. 
which is badass. Do you know it? No. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. Hell May yeah. God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, cast into hell Satan and all evil souls who wander through the earth, Based. seeking the ruin of souls. Based. Yeah. <laughs> and then some churches, like Assumption Church, they'll, they'll do three Hail Marys before the St. Michael prayer, which is kind of cool. Um, but it's the, it's, it's the imagery, man. Like, I want, I want walls of people who walked this earth who have done amazing things, who are lady or who God has appeared to. I want them plastered on the walls of our churches or in stained glass window, windows or on statues so I can be reminded of who they were and who I can aspire to be. I don't worship them. This umbrella here, we're sitting outside. If this umbrella was, let's say, a statue of Mary, I don't treat this umbrella as Mary. Mm. You know what I mean? I treat it as a reminder of Mary. Okay, if Mary's right here, I'm going to kneel down. I'm going to say a prayer. You know, I'm not going to say a prayer to this statue or to this umbrella. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and there's a great, um, they're not Benedictine priests. I forget, St. Michael's Abbey. There's a great video of some guy that says, you know, we get a lot of the criticism. Why would you kneel down at a statue of Mary? Mm. And he says, I treat the statue of Mary as if Mary was here, where is if Mary was right in front of me right now, you bet I would get down on one knee and I, and I, I would just want her to give me a big hug. So, so it, it's very weird that that's one of the big, um, I think, red flags that a lot of Protestants have or a lot of other types of denominations have with Orthodox and Catholics is just the way that they venerate or, or you know, I, I like to say, I like to be a little controversial and say, yes, I worship the saints. Yes, I worship Mary. Because when you talk about, you know, worship from, um, from just a, a definitional point of view, what, is, what does worship mean? It means mm. to give the most honor to or to, or to follow or something like that. Um, and there are three levels of worship um, in Catholicism. There's Latria, uh, which is the worship given to God alone. It usually would like require a sacrifice or something like that. There's dulia, the veneration of saints, and then there's hyperdulia, which is to Mary. And you know, they, they, they those two types of worships aren't uh, directed towards God. There's the ultimate level, I guess, so to say, which is probably confusing. You're looking at me like, okay, this guy's getting into the weeds. No, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, <laughs> how about this? You, if you send me some re reading materials or some watching materials, yeah. I'll get into them. And if you and if if you want me to, I'll come to church to the Catholic Church with you while I'm here. Dude, come tomorrow, <laughs> like come tomorrow morning. That's Done. But, um, and yeah, it's great. And you know, the thing for me too is the tradition. We have I go to what's called the Latin Novus Ordo, um, so it's not a strict Latin Mass. Uh, the Latin Novus Ordo um, is basically what the Second Vatican Council kind of wanted the Mass to look like. I think they call it the Pauline Mass. Um, I actually had my priest on one of the episodes a couple episodes ago, but it's different when you go to evangelical church, you know, and I'm not saying that God is not there. I don't want to say that. I don't want to, you know, sometimes I might make a meme or something like that, but I don't want to say that because I, I, I think God is everywhere and God can be there. Mm. There's just something about being in an old church surrounded by stained glass, seeing a crucifix hanging, you know, uh, you know, from the ceiling seeing an altar that faces the east where the priest when he's doing the eucharistic prayers and he's not facing the congregation but he's facing the crucifix and he's facing east as a as a commemoration of the direction where christ was crucified because the mass is a celebration of christ's crucifixion i feel like it's we're like transported back to what early christians would do mm. you know what i mean it hasn't become so modernized and a lot of people would have a problem with what's called the novus ordo which is sort of maybe like the modern version of the mass where that's where you see like oh the guitar is now in the mass and people facing the congregation and maybe necessarily not being so strict you don't have to wear a veil you can take communion in the hand and like i said i see god everywhere and i can see god everywhere and the type of mass that one goes to i don't think dictates the type of catholic one is mm -hmm. and i think a lot of people who think that way they might be like a foot out mm. of the church and leads to, you know, apostasy or anything like that. But, um, I love, I love talking about this stuff. It's what more of this show has kind of turned into. Um, but yeah, it's a good message, man. Yeah. And there are plenty of churches. Like you can go to Novus Ordo, you can go to Latin mass, you can go to the Latin Novus Ordo that I go to. There's some down in Franklin, uh, Orthodox churches that you can visit. The ortho see it, it's, it's weird because as Catholics, we can go to any mass, any order 
any right. They call them rights. There are uh, 24, 24, 26 different rights of the uh, Catholic Church. We can go to those and receive communion because they're in communion with Rome. Can't go to an Orthodox service and receive communion just because they're out of communion with Rome, if that makes any sort of sense. Yeah. We yeah. can go, we can view the service, we can we can worship there, whatever. But when it comes to actually partaking in the Eucharist... It's yeah, it's probably one that. of the things that... Are n- one of the big next steps for me because I travel a lot at the moment for work. Like I was in Miami for a month and now I'm in Nashville for a month and then I'll be in Austin for a few weeks. And oh, okay. So you're not based here. No. Oh, I thought you moved here. No, no, no. I'm considering it. Oh, okay. But so my, my thing is at the moment that I'm, I went to Florida for a month, see if I like it there. Sure. Now I'm in Nashville for a month, see if I could live here. Mm. And then I'm going to go to Austin for a few nice. weeks and okay. see if I could live yeah. there. And then we've got a few things. I can tell you off, off air of some of the sure, plans sure, that sure. I've got, but I can't quite reveal them just yet. But, um, uh, and then we've got a few months of traveling to do. Yeah. And then around September, October, I'm coming back here and I want to build a studio somewhere and, and, and awesome. base myself somewhere. Awesome. And I think Miami and Florida is a great place for content and for, for being able to just be around a lot of creators. However, it might be a little bit crazy for me, a little bit hectic for mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. I kind of like the quieter life a little bit more. Yeah. So Nashville is, I'm seriously considering moving here and setting up. It's a great, up I moved here. here from New York. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll see if I like Texas as well. So once I get to the place where I'm more established somewhere and I've like, I'd really love to get it plugged into a church. I'm, I'm desperately lacking having community around me. If I'm just totally honest with you, like I'm yeah. desperately lacking having friends around. Oh yeah. Because I'm so bi- like, if you saw my upload schedule, you, you know that I work 12, 15 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah. And you know, that that's my life at the moment, but I would love to be based in a place where I've got a community church mm-hmm. friends who I can have these sorts of conversations with all the time yeah. and where I can just sort of develop my relationship with God. And yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. So, and also in pursuit of a family as well. So yeah, that's, that's my, my aim at the moment. But um, yeah, once I'm settled, I'd love to be able to, to do that more. Yeah. And I think that, that that's definitely one of the priorities that I think one should take into consideration when he's, when he's moving somewhere. Uh, Nashville, which I think is great, has a really good community of Christians. And, you know, whether it's Catholics or whether it's, you know, the evangelicals or non-denominational. Um, I'm actually in a... Do you know the app GroupMe? No. There's this app called GroupMe, and I guess it's useful for gigantic group chats. So I'm part of the Catholics in Nashville group chat. There's like a Catholic politics, which is... It's kind of gotten really autistic, and just, <laughs> I, I have n- nothing to do with it. But I've actually... Uh, met some really cool people through those types of things. So it'd be one of those things where like, okay, maybe join on here and, you know, go to, go to different masses, see what, see what mm. you like. Don't necessarily like window shop for the most part, go, go, go take the recommendations and, you know, wherever you feel kind of at home, if you can talk to the priest, if you can talk to the people in the congregation and ask them, you know, what compelled you to join this congregation. Mm. Just do as much, put as much, I don't want to say put as much emphasis into the work that you do on a daily basis, but I think you probably should. If you're going to discern, you know, where you want your spiritual life to lead, definitely, you know, put in the same amount of work, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good to know, man. Yeah, Na- Nashville's a great city. I think, um, not too sure about Austin. I know Florida, just historically, is, you know, a good Catholic state because it's, you know, Catholic uh, missions in in Florida, you know, and a lot of the, a lot of the names of cities are you know, saints, uh, California too, the same way. Um, Texas, probably San Antonio is just St. Anthony, mm. which is really cool. Um, but yeah, Austin, I'm not too sure of, I don't know. I know that we have plenty of probably mutual friends in, in Texas, probably more in the Dallas area, I think. Mm. Um, but I don't, I don't know what, what it's like over there. I just, I, I love Nashville. I love the community. And, um, yeah, the reason why we're going to the church that we now belong to is because we have neighbors down the road who are um there's they have they had one daughter who's the same age as my daughter so they play together and then one day i can't remember what we were talking about but uh the wife was saying oh you're catholic i said yeah where do you go holy family why don't you come to our church Hmm. saint mary's i said okay and we went to saint mary's and i was like whoa i because i was going to a latin mass every now and then but the latin novus ordo was just so different i was like i I like this Hmm. it's it's where i feel like i belong and i could still you know have my my reverent masses, you know, during the week if I want to, but this is kind of where I want to be on Sundays. Um, and that sort of community is something that I've always been looking for because I didn't really have a church community um, in my 20s. I think if I did, maybe things would have been a little bit different, but I'm kind of glad I didn't. Is there many nice single ladies? At our, dude, at our church? Mm. And this sounds bad because my wife's like, what are you What are you doing noticing? You should be <laughs> noticing. I'm like, no, I notice. Um, our parish... And even, you know, Assumption, the strictly Latin mass parish, 
a lot of super young families, but a lot of single women, I've noticed. And you know how to tell a single woman, white veil. Mm -hmm. So they got the white veil, single. Um, and I actually had a friend of mine saying, dude, we had to move churches because these guys kept on hitting on my sister. It got <laughs> annoying. And I was like, yes, I can only imagine that. Yeah. But yes. But That's good to know. Yeah, our, our, our parish right now, if you see a couple with one kid, it's rare. Like five kids, six kids, seven that's, kids. It's that's nuts. Good, man. You know, we've, we we've got two. We We're doing. on the low end. But uh, yeah, I heard this. Listen to this. Someone said, you know, when I heard be fruitful and multiply, I took it serious because if you only have two kids, you're just replicating yourselves. But when you have seven, you are creating generations mm. of people. And I was like, whoa. Yeah, maybe I'm not so serious right now. I got to yeah. get at least another one in there. You do, man. I think so. At I least think, three. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, you, you're aware of Gavin McInnes, right? Yeah, I love Gavin McInnes. Man. I think he said one kid is for gays, yeah, two yeah. is for, you know, two, is, two you're on the right track, and yeah. then three, yeah. Um, this is good advice, especially for, you know, Catholic families, but. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so what's, so, so, so what's next? I, I, I assume that, um, that you want to not necessarily make strictly spiritual or Christian-centered videos, but you have a big workload. Are you going to do more? Uh, interviews, you're going to do more kind of breakdown videos. Where do you see your channel evolving to? Because right now, where yeah. you're at like half a million, are you at half a million followers? Yeah, 500 subscribers. I think. That's crazy, dude. Yeah, it's cool, That's man. awesome. Yeah, it's great. Um, we do a lot of uh, debate breakdowns, and that's mm -hmm. good. But the, the idea is that I want to, like I said, m base myself somewhere towards the end of the year and build out a studio. Mm -hmm. So then there'll be a lot more interview content. Right. Yeah, you'll, I'll, I'll, you'll be one of the first to come into the studio if I'm in Nashville, that's for awesome. sure. Um, a lot more interview content. There'll be a lot more sort of uh, like live streams during the day just from the studio. I want to have that that base, but for now, I'm I'm getting a lot of life experience under my belt. Like for example, last year we went to Taiwan, we went to South Korea, went to the demilitarized zone oh, on, really? on the border of North Korea. Like we went um, like around Europe to places like okay. Romania and Italy, and then Mexico this year. And mm -hmm. I like having that knowledge of those places and going and understanding places around the world. So have to I get out. Have to get so out. So when the I world. when yeah. I speak to these global issues, I've got a little bit of of that sort of like practical knowledge of these yeah. places. So I'm going to do a bit more of that this year and going to go travel to a few places. Um, but the idea with the content is to continue the debate breakdowns. But the reason why I've got now the reality-based podcast mm -hmm. is because um, I'm trying to get people used to the idea that I'm going to be doing a lot more interviews in the future. Right, right, right. And I'm just sort of like trial and erring. It's tr doing a bit of trial and error, seeing what, like having a lot of different guests on at the moment from all different walks of life, seeing what the audience likes, seeing what I'm best at. But the main thing that I want to do is be hosting debates. Okay, awesome. That's, and that's coming. Like moderating them? Moderating or? debates. Okay, okay. Because I think I'm very naturally curious. Yeah. I liked it. Like, did you watch the UFC? Yeah. You know John Anik, the commentator? Mm -hmm. I like to think of myself as kind of like a John Anik type. Okay. You know? Oh, interesting. I'm not, I'm not going to get in the cage myself, but I'll commentate on the fights. Right. I'm not I'm not like a... I don't really enjoy debating that much. I'm not the, I'm not that kind of guy very mm -hmm. much. Like, I can do it if I have to. There's though. a personality yeah. that really succeeds at debating. But I, yeah. I'm very curious, and mm. I love listening to people's points of view. And I'm like totally autistic about debates i love watching debates i do it all day every day really yeah when i'm when I, and like before i started my channel i had this massive backlog of debates that i'd watched uh -huh. so then when i started the channel i was like nobody really knows about these awesome debates so i brought them out to the forefront and was able to do that so i'm trying to get debates happening at the moment and i'm trying it's going to be reality based debate reality based debate nights okay but it's very hard to match make yeah yeah i've actually tried to line one up with nick he doesn't know about this, but <laughs> I tried to um, get a Jewish rabbi to come on and debate the idea of anti-Semitism. Anti yeah. With, and I was like, look, Nick is a very influential guy. He's got a massive following. You know, this would be a very, like, consequential debate. And I got in touch with this uh, rabbi through another friend of mine. And I was like, because my, my, the friend of mine was like, if you want to have a debate, this rabbi is the guy. He's okay. the one to go to. He's a auth like, a, like a repository of knowledge. And I was like, cool. I got on the phone with him and I was like, look, I think you should debate this guy, Nick Fuentes. He said, no, I would never debate Nick Fuentes because Nick Fuentes is, uh, said he wants to kill Jewish people. And I just thought to myself, why not? Why, not? Yeah. why wouldn't and, you and then? That's what I thought. And I was like, that is exactly why you should. If you yeah, really exactly. think that, why don't you go and debate him? And why don't you expose him to the whole world as this monster that you claim him to be? But no, the fact of the matter is that people are scared to debate. Where's the zealousness? Yeah. Especially of a rabbi, of a, of a thought leader. Of yeah, a, of and a... he's, but, but this guy was like meant to be the, the guy, you know? Oh, and um, so I was like, wow, people are really scared to debate. And like, it's difficult because if people are 
scared to debate like that, then it's very hard to line up these conversations. So yeah. it's it, matchmaking is very difficult. But it I think is. once I get a few happening and once I get three, four, five debates going and if people are responsive to them, if there's some some clips that happen and go viral, yeah, more people will be open to the idea of jumping on the platform and doing the debate. 100%. Yeah. And I, I'm very much want to keep it like a sports commentator type thing. Like in the blue corner, we have got X. In the red okay. corner, we've got Y. Battle out the but ideas. But like proper like Harvard rules, like debating kind of thing? No, it'll be, it'll, it won't be blood sport debating. Okay. It'll be... You have your opening statements, yeah. and then you have cross examination, right? And then you you can we can just sort of go from there. So it'll, it'll be no like I I won't put up with people just coming in bad faith and doing a bunch of straw mans and personal attacks. Yeah, up, and I'll, I'll I'll intervene there. I want it to be like the best ideas win. What was the um What was the debate channel? I don't know if it was on public radio or was it a YouTube channel? Uh, was it? Intelligence squared. Yeah, yeah. I, I like those debates where the, they they had the audience, you know, vote on, you know, uh, which, uh, you know, which side. That's the, actually what I was thinking of doing. Right. It's and, funny yeah, you should say that because like, I was going to say, if you live stream, like, it could be a, cool. Do a poll before it and see who do you agree with, and right. then do a poll after and see who was able to change people's minds. Right. So then that becomes the object of the debate is to change people's minds and to bring people to your side. Yeah. Rather than to get clips and win points. Right. Right. Because right. if you don't change people's mind, you lose. Yeah. And the, and the problem is, I was actually. Do you know who Bryson Gray is? It sounds very familiar. Uh, Christian rapper. Is he a black guy? Yeah. 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 We were talking last night because we had uh, we had this space where we were just disagreeing and kind of being combative on Twitter. We're friends in real life. Uh, and he talked about he talked about debates, and he says it's very hard for him to have debates just because he's done it so many times. And he'd be a great you know person to bring on uh, yeah, yeah, as a debate person. Got, man, him but um, he says people come in with the biases. You know, if it's Candace versus Ben, people are already know who they're going to side with, regardless of who. If Ben cr- quote unquote crushes Candace or the other way around, the person's still not going to be like, okay, well, Candace did change my mind. Like it's very hard. It's, Especially in person, maybe online, you know, you're behind that wall of anonymity. You can just be like, yes, uh, Ben Shapiro changed my mind, even yeah. though I don't think, but hit that button. Mm. But there's something else I wanted to ask you because when I was when I was doing the show full time and doing the Instagram, I, I don't think I handled the pressure of uploading and of making content. How do you handle that? Uh, because just, you've, you've yeah. got the audience, you know. 20 times that you know that I that I do and it's just like it's got to be a lot of pressure right in pressure in what sense in feeling do you feel the need to upload content constantly or does your audience have a sort of um um relationship with you where um they're not expecting stuff all the time when you upload it's awesome but there it's not like a mm. you know um all day, 24-7, yeah. constantly creating clips, constantly posting to Instagram, constantly posting to X, and then constantly posting to YouTube. If a video doesn't get as many views as that video, does it kind of tear you down a little bit? Like, Nah, I'm pretty thick-skinned about it all, to be honest. Um, I'm So we work very hard, mm-hmm. like I said. Like my brother, Vinny, is an absolute machine. Yeah, He will sit at that computer for 15 hours straight editing and not look at his phone once. Yep, helped us yeah. out today. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's a killer. Um, so... We're, we're, we're very lucky to have that bond as well, where we're obviously brothers and we're like mm-hmm. fucking ride or die. Right. You know? So um, my audience, I, I don't think that they necessarily but expect that much because I think that they kind of understand that the quality of the content that we put out is pretty high. Yeah. And when I release a video, I'm not going to sort of see something happen and be like, oh, I've got to get out first and just do some crappy video. Right. Sometimes something major will happen. It will take me two or three days to release a video about it because I'm writing very detailed scripts, I'm doing research, I'm adding a lot of context to what people are saying just in case they don't understand. And then when the video comes out, it'll hopefully add value to the conversation. I don't wanna just be one of those reaction YouTubers who just sort of streams to um, like to StreamYard or to whatever and just stops it occasionally. He goes, oh, you know, that person just got destroyed or just gives some sort of bullshit talking point. I think think very hard about my scripts and I, I analyze every sentence that I say. So mm. people might watch my videos and think that I'm spitballing. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah, they're very detailed scripts. Yeah, a lot of the time I was like, okay, wow, this guy's pretty concise and I can go on for a while. Mm. Uh, but now, I mean, I, I would assume that you you done some writing before that. If you didn't have Vinny, would you f- maybe feel a little bit more pressure as far as like getting everything out on time and yeah, doing no, everything by yourself? He was living in Japan when I started the channel. But before that, we'd done stuff together. So I knew that he'd be on board eventually and I was doing all of the editing. Yeah. It was very difficult. 
Oh yeah, I've really I, I, I've really, I'm not. I'm yeah. not. I'm not tech savvy. I don't like that side of things. I get very frustrated when I'm editing. Mm -hmm. I'm very much like a creative head in the clouds type guy. Yeah, and I really need people underneath me who are good at tying the tying everything together. Mm. So my ideal role in the future would be to have the studio, be thinking about the content be moderating debates and just be thinking and speaking and thinking and speaking and thinking and speaking and writing mm -hmm. rather than having to deal with all of the, like the little technical nuances and right. all the finance. It's side distracting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. So I was just thinking of another good person you can have on a debate and for on one side, if anything, like George Janko, who's, Oh yeah. Yeah. He's, I, he's yeah. probably made that switch from, you know, mainstream commentary or with the Logan Paul stuff to the sort of Christian side. He's probably had a, uh, one of the probably better transitions that I've seen recently now, how I believe it's genuine 100%, but that uh, I remember that podcast with Jordan Peterson was a little, mm. a little kind of iffy uh, where he maybe had been a little bit too, I don't want to say prideful, but maybe a little bit overzealous where I don't know. I don't know. Do you know much of his story? Is he, Do you know what's funny, man? Yeah. George Janko unknowingly has played a big role in the way that I carry myself. Really? Yeah. So, Funny story, I um, one of the big questions that I had, especially towards the end of last year, was like, like I said, like I'm still having this question, which is how do I carry myself and how do I, what is my voice mm -hmm. when it comes to like being a Christian in this space and promoting these ideas that I want to promote and representing Christ? Because, you know, oftentimes I find myself maybe getting a little bit too, like, attacking people on my mm -hmm. videos sometimes. And, you know, yeah. there's, 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 there's elements that I sort of needed to rein in a little bit. And then I actually met George Jenko last year randomly. I was at a Halloween party. My friend Jeff Dyer, who's a comedian, we were just hanging out in L.A. And then he was like, oh, come to a, this Halloween party tonight. And it was up in the Hollywood Hills somewhere. It was a cool party. And so we got there and then I was just sitting around in a circle and then George Jenko walks in. I didn't really know anything about him. I knew that he was like, used to be on the Logan mm -hmm. Paul podcast or whatever. This guy owned a room like I've never seen before. Really? Yeah. Very, very charismatic guy. You can probably pick it from the podcast, but the way he walked in and just sort of had everybody wrapped around his little finger was a very impressive because this was a room full of comedians mm -hmm. and comedians are very much always like, like they're attention seeking people just yes. naturally. Yes. So they're all competing for the spotlight and George comes in with his girlfriend and just like sort of made everyone laugh and was having all these jokes and games with everyone. And I thought to myself, oh, I don't really get very impressed by people very often, but I was super, super impressed by the way he carried himself. And then it just stuck with me. And I was like, mm, I'd like to be able to sort of like be, be that confident in, in when I, when I walk into a room, just every man sort of compares himself like that. And then I heard him on a podcast with Andrew Tate. And one of my biggest gripes with Andrew Tate is that like, I feel like he's got a lot of pride, you mm -hmm. know? And then I, George Janko was talking to Andrew Tate about how the way that he's procured this confidence in himself when he walks in a room is that every time he's in these situations, he says, God, you have my tongue. And I thought, oh, that's it. Yeah. That's the thing. I've got too much pride and I'm too self-conscious when I'm in these situations. But if I could lend my tongue to God or if I could just give my tongue to God and say, look, this is not me talking this is not me who's gone and like developed all of this sort of like all of these followers and subscribers. I need us to like sort of get, get out of my own head about it yeah. and just give it to God. And since I've started doing that, it's been a massive help. So funny you should bring up George Jenko. Yeah. That's why you get him on the show. I wonder who he could possibly debate or have yeah. a discussion with would be interesting. Do you mind if I really quickly grab a jumper? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. I'll carry this on. No <laughs> editing here. Yeah. Jake's getting a little chilly. It's, you know, compared to, you know, the Gold Coast of Australia, it's a little brisk, but it's absolutely beautiful. And the house that I'm sure he's staying in is blocking out the sun at this time of day. Uh, so the sun is on the other side of the house. So Jake has gone to get a sweater. But uh, what, a, what, what a guy. What a nice guy so far. Um, and if you can, Rattlesnake TV on YouTube. I find myself at work. I'll throw on one of his videos and then I will do the work that I'm doing. And I'll throw that on in the background and it's good because if you don't have the time to watch hour, two hour long debates, what, what, what Jake will do is he'll probably take, you know, a, a lot of the better parts or the more contentious parts or the more interesting parts of the debates and he'll play those clips and then he'll break them down. He'll kind of give you a cliff notes of the talks or discussions or debates and um, it's very refreshing. It's one of the ways that I'm able to, di to digest a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, videos that are on YouTube and, you know, 
We won't go too much longer. No, man, I'm, I'm, I'm chilling. I'm happy. What else? What else have you been? Have you been thinking about maybe either culturally or politically going on? How do you see? Okay, how do you see? I mean, do because for the most part, you're not necessarily covering like news, you're not doing too much news, but do you see Trump winning a, a second term? Um. Yes, I think that if if all things go as the way that they should go, mm-hmm. I think that he will win a second term. I'm a, I'm 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 apprehensive about this period of history because I know that I think that we're in a calm before a storm right now mm-hmm. in terms of US politics. It yeah. seems as though everything's a bit sort of quiet and Trump's not doing too much in terms of appearances and Joe Biden's camp seem to think that he's going to be running again. I don't think that that's going to happen. I think that there's going to be some sort of event that happens. Oh yeah, where Jill Biden has to come out and say, you know, we're not going to be. <laughs> oh really? Is that what you see? Okay. I I think that the Democrats would be foolish unless they think that there's some sort of way that they could win the election, uh, some other way that they could win the election. I think that they would they'd be foolish to bring out Joe Biden as their candidate. Yeah. Because no one. Likes I've always him. thought that. I haven't met anybody who likes him. Yeah. And no, unless, I, I haven't and, either. And like if if they do say they like him, then their reasons are just total cope. Well, it's Total, either that just or like they just hate Trump. Clutching on to, right. yeah. And I think a lot of people actually just uh, just, closet, nice. just closet like Trump as well, man. So oh, yeah. I would yeah. be, what I think the Democrats might do is they might roll out a Michelle Obama and Gavin Newsom partnership. It would be a massive thing, but I mean, does anything really shock us these days? No, no, nothing does. Uh, how does that resonate back home in Australia? How does American politics resonate? Well, that's half the reason I had to move out because the way I see it is, American politics is what informs everything else. Mm-hmm. So if if America is the absolute epicenter for culture, it's the epicenter for politics, all of the geopolitical decisions that America makes affects other countries. It affects Australia. We follow you guys into war. So this is the very center of it. And people aren't that interested over there. And if you say that you love Trump in America, it's like saying that you love Satan. Like in Australia, sorry. Really? People are that like brainwashed. They because the mainstream news and everything in Australia, Australians are very apathetic about politics. Okay, for the most part. Yeah, people care and, and whatnot, but for the most part, the GFC in two thousand and eight didn't really affect us that badly. We haven't had any major wars recently. The last right. one, I mean, we helped out America and Iraq, and we sent troops to Vietnam. But there's no like, last time we were bombed was was Darwin during World War Two. The yeah. Japanese bombed us. Yeah, so, and no one really cares that much about it to be honest. So we haven't had that sort of like civil war in our home home turf where we're just kicking out the enemy. We don't have that sort of like like that tangible feeling of freedom like Americans have. Yeah. So Australians tend to be pretty apathetic and just think that everything's going to be cool, which for the most part it is in Australia. Okay. But I'm more interested in these things. So I just get along with people in America a lot better yeah. because you guys really care. Yeah, we do. We do to a certain extent. It's very easy to get on the black pill though about American politics, but when you realize that... It's kind of all the same. It's really not going to affect your life as much as you think it will. Mm. Um, that it is more incumbent upon you to do uh, the best things for yourself and for your community, your local community, and you know your spiritual community and your family, obviously. But you know, you know, the prices of gas aren't necessarily going to affect me so much. So where I go into a mental breakdown about who I'm going to vote for or. Um, I think maybe the only issue that probably would have would have would have really bothered me if there was an election uh, was uh, the COVID stuff. Mm. Like that, that that would probably um, sway me to vote a certain way. It, it is true, man. Like I, I definitely see what you mean about getting black pilled about it, and I don't really. I like some candidates. I don't really care too much about the parties. I think that it's, it's pretty much a uniparty, and when, yeah. when you do realize that you do get pretty black pilled about it, I think that Donald Trump has the potential to be that jarring like force that jarring populist force that gives people hope you yeah know? And i think that the hope that he gives people and the renewed sense of like vigor that he gives people is more important than the politics itself mm-hmm. because if you think about it trump in 2016 was the first time so many people in america had felt like anybody even sees them yeah so long all of those oh, people yeah. in middle america who were destroyed by these sort of like neoliberal mm-hmm. policies and all of their factories and mines have been shut down and they're just living in these like wastelands and then they get this guy who comes along and he's charismatic and he makes you laugh and he holds these great rallies and he brings people together and he makes you feel like that there's like there's hope for america right. again and america's not just going down the toilet yeah so i think that he's got that intangible x factor 
that gives people something that you just can't get through the ballot box. But just like the personal stuff that he's done, where you hear stories about, you know, he's flown people to get cancer treatments or stuff like that, or that one that one video of the woman who who's, you said, you know, Mr. Trump, um, I've been going through chemotherapy. I don't have that much longer to live, but you helped me out or you wrote something or you did something for me. And then Trump was like, we're going to pay for your kid's school. When, when you're not here anymore, your kid's all taken care of. And I'm just like, when's the last time a politician actually reaches into his own pockets mm. to do that? And it's not that he's necessarily, you know, buying votes, because I think Trump, Trump did that before he was running. He was a very philanthropic guy. So, you know, people can say whatever they want about him, his, you know, his policy direction, all that kind of stuff. But I think he genuinely cares about people in this country. Yeah. And he's, he's a real human. People sort of relate to him. Yeah. And for me, like just from an outsider's perspective as well, he is what America is like he is the <laughs> epitome and the embodiment of what it means to be brash and to be bold yeah. and to have that swagger about you and to be an entrepreneur and to mm -hmm. build massive buildings and structures and right. when you look when you think about the american dream you think about donald trump so that's why i think that he like the symbol of trump is what's so like important and so refreshing even more than the the political side of things and yeah i i, I do think that there's a renewed hope and vigor in a big in large swaths of americans who feel like hitherto no one really gave a shit about them right yeah i, th I think i think november is going to be i think regardless of who the democrat run uh, run i think that um i think trump's gonna win um and i did a show a couple a couple episodes ago about why i might not be voting for trump and i think one of my uh policy lines in the sands is is abortion and if if it's not an outright ban i can't get behind you you know mm -hmm. what i mean and the fact that he's still kind of like this, uh, is he a 16 week guy or, you know, nine weeks, something like that. I'm just like, no, zero, zero weeks. Yeah. See, Trump, he, he's the, he's the, the man who is the author of the art of the deal. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I see a lot of those, like people think, a lot of people think that Trump is like bought and sold Zionist. They think that he is totally in the pockets of Israelis. Yeah. I tend to take a slightly different perspective to that. I do think that he appeals to, he appeases these guys. Playing the game. He, because he knows how to play yeah. the game and he knows whose back he needs to scratch and win. Oh, yeah. He's not necessarily controlled. I think so too. But the problem is that like with abortion, people will take that hard line like, like you take with that. Yeah. And I take the same hard line in my personal life. But I think that the question that a lot of people have and the question that Trump would have, <laughs> the question... I think the question that a lot of people have and the question that, that Trump would have would be, can you win an election right. like that? And right. but, but, but if you, so if you, if you say that you are nine week, 16 week, whatever, to get the faith of a certain uh, female demographic right. and then you get elected and you can enact your policies, is that more effective than saying that you're going to and be taking a hard line the and right. then no. losing the election yeah. and then having the Democrats? Right. As far as like a political strategy, yeah. I, I do get that. But as far as an idealistic, you know, uh, position that I myself have, like I just, hey, you know, Trump nominated the judges who overturned Roe v. Wade. You know what I mean? Like they happen to be Catholic and all that kind of other stuff, which is great. Like, cool. We like mm. that. But for me, I can't participate in it. I hope I hope I hope it I hope it I I hope it works out good and if it does and if it, the policies start getting better awesome, but a lot of people are like Mike you know you have to there's the lesser of two evils position and then there is the allow someone who is the right person to be in there to work on those policies to get them where you know you and you know the people who think like you mm. you know want them and if he doesn't win then you what's can't the get other there. option uh, as far as like Republican option or, or well I mean. So, oh, so you're talking about who you want to be the Republican candidate? No, no, I'm just saying, like, I personally couldn't vote for anybody who had any line in the sand when it came to abortion. It's either, it's either, it's, it's got to be zero for me. And I understand that from a political point of view, it's very tough to win an election mm. on a total outright ban. So, who abortion. would you vote for if nobody at the ballot box? You wouldn't nobody. vote. Yeah, yeah. So, my position is on the lesser of two evils: choose none, because both are still quote unquote evil. I'm not saying mm. that Donald Trump is evil. Um, I'm not even saying that like Joe Biden is evil. Like I don't think these people are inherently evil. Um, I just think policies are bad and they lead to de they lead to destructive paths. But I hope that if I had to have anyone in there, I hope Trump wins because he has been doing good on the quote unquote pro life side. Yeah. So. Yeah, I get what you mean. So I think what you're kind of saying is that your principles are more str uh, more 
your principles when it comes to things like abortion are more important. You think that there's actually a, an, a positive in taking that really hard line against an issue like that. Yeah. And if, that if enough people, if there was enough of a congregation of people that took that hard line, then it would right. actually influence. Yeah, 100%. Though, if it came down to the swing state plot of the movie where it's virtually, it's, it's tied vote by vote and Mike is the last person on earth to vote for who's going to win the election and Mike has previously stated that he's not going to vote for it. Obviously. That could I be would. the case. Oh, right, <laughs> right, right. Obvi- well, not with the electoral college. But obviously, <laughs> I would vote, you know, I would vote for Trump there. Like, that, it's just, it's, it's obvious. If, if it was all on my shoulders and um, I was the last guy, but yeah, but, you know, Tennessee's a red state. It's always going to be a red state for the most part. I mean, depending, but um oh, yeah. you'd, you'd freaking hope so man i've heard i've heard nashville's getting a little bit more liberal and you guys had like a liberal yeah when, or something? well we no mayors, mayors. The, the mayors of the cities of the big cities they're, they're always they're always liberal for the most part uh, we went from one democrat to another democrat recently um and it's like any big city uh it'll have its sections of uh liberalness like east nashville super liberal um, when you start to get outside of davidson county which is the county nashville's in then you start to get a lot more red but in the city, it's kind of split. But, um, you know, it's the people who control the city now. So it's, it's seemingly more of a blue city. Mm. Um, but it's just, you know, local community. You have to really put in the effort to kind of keep it the way that, that it's been and that you want it to be. Um, but people down here in the South, they don't play. Yeah. 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 That's cool. That's the thing that I like about Tennessee. And I think that if I did move here, I mean, I'd probably move to somewhere like may- maybe on the outskirts, you mm-hmm. know. The, where I'm at, yeah. Yeah, yeah get, a, get a bit of a bigger block of land and get a bit of space and that's get a the dog, dream. You know? Yeah, that, that's, that's definitely the dream for sure. Well, listen, thank you, Jake. You've been out here for a little bit. What is it? Hour, hour, almost hour and a half. I'm so happy to, uh, to have had you agree to come on. It's awesome. Um, please go to Rattlesnake TV on YouTube, right? Twitter, is it just? Uh, Jake Rattle SNK on uh, Instagram, Instagram and Twitter. Awesome. Thank you guys and tune in. I don't know when. I don't know when I'm going to do another show. Maybe next week, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Awesome. That was nice. I don't want to touch anything. I don't want to feel like if I hit record, if it stops it or whatever. Hey, Vinny. Hold on. Can you come um, stop the thing? Just Wait, should I just press record? Yeah, I'll turn it on because um, he's going to give me the so SD card. Do you, do you know your friends are your butt? No, I don't. I think, yeah, I think, like, if you started doing that and if you had a couple of episodes that, like, you know, got traction and stuff, I think, like, he would definitely be compelled to, to go on there. Um, he seems like a nice guy, too. Yeah, he, seems he, like, he was a good fellow. Yeah? Yeah, I'll put the... Uh,